All right, here we are, uh, the book of Jude, part two. We're going to cover verses 17 uh, all the way to the end of this one chapter epistle. So let's do a little bit of uh, review, shall we, of what we've learned so far. First of all, in the salutation part of the epistle, verses one and two, Jude, the earthly brother of James and Jesus, um, he refers to the church as the called out, the beloved of God, the ones who are kept for Jesus. And he recognizes the high regard and value of the church, uh, which is God's most valuable creation. You know, when you think about it, you know, God's created you know, a billion stars and the church is worth more to him than the, the billion stars. Uh, and so there's a, there's a great value that we see uh, Jude uh, placing on the church um, uh, in, God's, uh, in God's eyes. And of course he uh, refers to the fact that Christ died for the church uh, and um, uh, you know, no, no other organism, no other unit, no other thing in creation has God sacrificed in order, to, uh, in order to save. You know, so animals go in extinct and God doesn't stop that. Uh, stars flame out and God doesn't stop that. But God interceded in human history in order to uh, save man's soul. Then he, uh, he talks about uh, the danger, verses three and four. Uh, he was going to write a general kind of epistle, you know, uh, a general epistle on Christianity, uh, if you wish. Uh, encouraging uh, the uh, brothers to remain faithful and so on and so forth, but instead he, cho he chose to write about uh, a certain threat that was uh, facing the church at that time. There was a form of Gnostic teaching, uh, Gnostic from Gnosis which means uh, knowledge, uh, a form of Gnostic teaching that promoted the idea that the body and the spirit were actually separate so that what was done in one did not affect the other. And as I mentioned in our last lesson, this type of teaching, uh, this ty if, you, if you bought into this type of teaching, it led to, uh, among other things, immoral physical behavior uh, because uh, people would think that whatever they did in the body had no effect on their soul. Now there were two uh, major or main dangerous effects of this teaching. One, uh, as I mentioned, it would give excuse to sin without guilt or fear and this would lead to an immoral lifestyle. Uh, let's face it, sinners like sin, right? The flesh is easily drawn to sin. And what holds a, an unsaved person back from you know, all out sin is the law, which you know, causes guilt and threatens punishment and so on and so forth. And what holds the saved back from sin is the power of grace working in our lives moving us to obey God out of love and out of, out of gratitude. So if there's no connection between the actions of the flesh and our souls, then the unsaved will give themselves wholeheartedly to sin and the saved may be seduced into returning to the practice, uh, the practice of sin, which was you know, what was leading them to condemnation in the first place. You know, think about it, if, if Eve uh, who had no sin at all could be seduced into sin, then imagine Christians can be seduced into sin rather easily as well because, uh, you know, well, we're sinners, right? Eve, Eve you know, was created perfect. She had no sin in her. You know, no, quote, weakness of the flesh, but she was seduced into disobeying God. So imagine us, if that happened to her, imagine us, our flesh is full of sin. Uh, if, we, if we see no consequence in it, how easily seduced we could be. And then the other danger of this doctrine is the fact that it denies the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I mean, if there's no connection between the body and the soul, you know, the flesh and the spirit, then what Jesus did in His, in his, in his body has no effect spiritually. You know, the cross is for nothing. Why, why go to the cross? So by providing this teaching, they were denying the gospel and the cross of Christ. And of course, this is the danger that Jude is warning them against. You know, if there's no connection between the body and the soul, as far as sin is concerned, then the offering up of Jesus' body pays for sins, but he didn't have to do that because you know, no one is condemned. 
So his cross was for nothing. So this is why in verse three, he tells them, he tells the, the Christians to strive or fight or make an effort to maintain the faith or the set of teachings concerning Jesus and His word already given to them by the apostles and not go off to some new teaching or additional teaching. You know, we're to do the same today in our day as well. We're to stick to the same gospel as was taught to them many years ago. And then he talks about the dangerous men in verses five to 16. So after summarizing the danger, Jude warns his readers that those who disobey God will be punished no matter who they are. And he gives examples of those who were punished in the past. You know, the nation of Israel was punished for disobeying in the desert. Uh, the angels were punished for disobeying in the spiritual world. And even the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were punished for disobeying in the secular world. So he describes how these false teachers operate. Uh, they have immoral behavior, they reject Christ's authority, they use false spirituality, and he says that they will be punished like the rest for their uh, disobedience. Now, one reason that he compares them to Israel and angels and so on and so forth is that their attitude was proud and they saw themselves as superior to the apostles and not subject to discipline or authority. So Jude reasons that if God punished his own chosen nation, as well as the mighty angels when they disobeyed, he could and he will punish these false teachers for their sins as well, no matter how highly they thought of themselves. And then he finishes his rebuke by comparing these men to uh, underwater reefs that destroy, or waterless clouds that promise but don't deliver in the end, uh, fruitless trees and so on and so forth. And he says that in every generation, ever since the beginning of time, such people never escape the judgment and the punishment of God and they will not escape in their generation as well. And so in the final section, uh, that we're going to cover in this lesson, Jude will explain to his readers how to avoid the danger, a lesson that applies not only to that congregation, those people, but certainly applies to us today in the modern world as well. So how do you avoid the danger? So let's go to uh, Jude and pick up in verse 17. He says, but you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. So the first thing he says to them is, heed the warnings. Heed the warnings of your teachers. You know, uh, here he's saying Jesus' apostles warned of these trials and these types of temptations. You know, Paul warned the elders in Acts uh, chapter 20 when he met with them. And Peter warned in 2 Peter chapter 3, again the leaders, there was a warning given to the church to be on guard against this type of thing, not only then, but in, 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 in every generation. Then he goes on to say in verse 20 and 21, um, but you beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So what does he say? Number two, he says, build yourselves up spiritually. So how do you protect against false teachers and false doctrine coming in? Well, heed the warning of your teachers who are teaching you the correct doctrine and build yourselves up spiritually. In other words, be proactive. You know, and how? He mentions, well, through prayer and through maintaining the love of God among yourselves and by persevering in waiting for the Lord. Don't get distracted by sin. Uh, be assured that the Lord will come. You know, false teachers <clears throat> and false teaching 
sometimes not always done uh, maliciously. Sometimes it's just laziness. Uh, sometimes it's just a, a bad idea that, that runs its course through the church and there's no one there to check it. But usually when people are paying attention, usually when the brethren are making an effort to love one another, usually when there's a strong prayer life in a congregation, uh, bad ideas, false teachings don't get very far. It's when a congregation is not paying attention, when, when a congregation becomes lazy spiritually, when there starts to be you know, division in the church, that's a, a, a congregation that becomes ripe for attack. Whether it's done you know, inadvertently or on purpose, still the, the, the church that is not prepared, the church that is not uh, uh, pre-warned, the church that is not proactively growing spiritually, they're the ones that become vulnerable to these type of things. And then he goes on to say in verse 22 and 23, and have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted uh, by uh, the flesh. So uh, what's, what's the message here? Uh, help the weak. How do you avoid the danger? Heed the warnings. Build yourself up spiritually. You know, be proactive spiritually and help those who are weak. Uh, weak in what? Well, weak in the faith in this case. Because if, if, if the church was strong in the faith, meaning they were maintaining the doctrine, you know, that one doctrine that he talked about, if the church was strong in the knowledge of the word, strong in the idea of preserving the unity, well, they're, they're, they'd be able to fend off attack. Well, in any congregation, there are those who are strong and those who are weak. So he says, well, help those who are weak in the faith. How? By teaching them and encouraging them and supporting them and so on and so forth. And try to bring those who are being carried away back to the faith. But there's the, you know, there's the warning, don't get too close to their sin lest you get carried away too. You know, some people say, well, you know, I go to bars and so on and so forth. You know, Jesus went to, to the, the sinners and the publicans. Yes, Jesus went to the sinners and publicans for what reason? To teach them, to bring them to the understanding and the knowledge of who He was. But He didn't hang around with them to share their vices. So we need to make sure that we're not hanging around with people simply to share their vices, but rather uh, to encourage them to be faithful and to believe. So there is danger, obviously, but you can do something about it for yourself and for others as well. And so we read in verse 24 or 25 how he kind of completes the epistle. He says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So that's the doxology. Uh, a, a doxology is a spontaneous burst of praise. And Jude ends his letter with praise for God and His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, he hasn't been talking about that subject. He hasn't been talking about how wonderful God is and, and, and how wonderful Jesus is and the wonderful things that they've done. And so he hasn't, he's been talking about trouble in the church, judgment on the troublemaker, warning to the, you know, to the brethren to be faithful and to persevere and to so on and so forth. That's what he's been talking about. And then out of nowhere, there's this boom, this expression of praise, that's, that's, that's what a doxology is, a, a sudden burst of, of praise and glory uh, to God. So what's he saying in this, uh, in this doxology? Well, first of all, he praises God for His ability to keep us from stumbling, in other words, from falling down into ignorance and sin. And he does this by providing His word and His spirit to guide us and to strengthen us. And in the modern church, we have the same thing, don't we, in today's church? Well, we have the same uh, strength given to us. We have God's word. You know? We have the Spirit of God living within us. And we also have the apostles are long gone, but we have you know, leaders in our 
uh, congregations, don't we? We have the elders that, that are leading us uh, spiritually. We have the evangelists and teachers that are teaching us the word, helping us to maintain the, the, that body of doctrine, helping us to pass that body of doctrine, that body of teaching about Christ and His cross and the church and so on and so forth, helping us to take that, learn it today and pass it on to our children, to the next generation, right? So this is how God is helping us today. And he also says, as far as the praise is concerned, he, he praises God for His work in bringing us to God. You know, without Christ, we come before God simply as condemned sinners. That's our status. But Jesus sheds His blood and brings us into God's presence as people who are forgiven, as people who are holy, as sons and daughters of God. There's no fear for us to come before God because the judgment uh, has been passed uh, over us, right? We've been found uh, 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 holy. We've been found uh, acceptable. Why? Because our sins are forgiven. Not because we haven't you know, sinned, not because we're not guilty of sin, but because God has forgiven us our sins. All right? And so He brings us in this state to rejoice before God forever, and only Jesus can do this thing. So Jude says that Jesus, who accomplishes this, and God the Father who offers it, deserve glory, deserve praise, and they deserve the majesty uh, 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 that they are in and that we, that we acknowledge uh, of them. They deserve dominion, rulership. They are God, they are in charge, and we're in submission to them. Uh, authority, or another word for authority, is judgment. They're the ones that will do the judgment, and they deserve to do the judgment, and we will accept their judgment. And they deserve all of these things, right? The, the, the majesty and the glory and the authority and so on and so forth. Uh, they deserve all of these things forever. They've always had it and they deserve to have it forever. That's, the, that's the, the sense of his praise, okay? The core of his praise. And so he closes with uh, the, uh, the word amen. Let it be so, this is the way it should be. You know? So Jude points out the false teachers. He reveals their sins. He warns against or rather about their punishment and then he encourages the saints to continue faithfully following the teachings given to them by the apostles. And he says, if they do, they will receive the blessings of heaven as surely as the false teachers will receive the punishments of hell. So basically, you know, in summary form, that's pretty much what uh, he is saying here in this letter. So in closing this brief series, I, I want to reemphasize the important fact that Jude appeals to his readers to follow this set body of doctrine that was already present and distributed throughout the church and considered authoritative by the apostles and the church leaders at that time. In other words, all the information about Christ, all the teaching about the church, everything we needed to know about salvation and God and the future and the return of Christ and so on and so forth, all of that has already been given, is already contained. There's no new information. There was no new information. You know, at, the, at the end of the writing of this here, which was back in the first century, at the end of the writing of the, of, of the New Testament, that's the sum total of the information that God has decided to give us about himself, about salvation, and about the future. So Jude's appeal in this letter was to hold on to that standard of teaching which was complete and non-negotiable. So even today, some 2,000 years later, we in the churches of Christ, we hold to this idea that the entire body of basic doctrine concerning Christianity was recorded and preserved in the first century, in the writing of this material. Now we know it was gathered together in book form several centuries later, but the actual production of it was complete back then. This is why we emphasize the idea that our task in teaching the scripture is not to, is not to change or add or subtract from this body of doctrine, but rather it's to, it's to, uh, to first of all, to understand 
That's our job. Our job's not to change this. Our job's to understand it. We study to understand precisely what the writers were saying to their readers in the first century church. This is why there is emphasis on the meaning of the original languages and the context of what was being said. We want to understand in English, in our day, what was being said in Hebrew and Greek uh, thousands of years ago, we, and, and we can. You know, it's not beyond us. There are some religious groups that promote the idea that the Bible's too complicated, you know, an ordinary person can't, but you know, Jesus never said that we could. Paul never said that we could. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, he says to Timothy, from an early age, you have known the holy writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Uh, what was Paul saying? He said, as a young person, you already knew what the scripture, what the Bible was saying, and the knowledge of that, the knowledge of the scriptures, led you to what? To salvation. He doesn't say there anywhere, well, you're, you, were, you were too young to read the Bible, you as a, an individual too ignorant to read the Bible, as an ordinary person, you couldn't understand the Bible. He didn't say that. He says, from an early age, you have known the Holy Rock. You knew, you were taught and you understood. So if Timothy, young man back then, could understand, we can understand today. And our job today, our task in the church, as far as Bible study is concerned, is to understand what the scriptures mean. We want to understand. That's why we, there's such an emphasis in the churches of Christ on Bible teaching. We have Bible class on Sunday mornings, uh, we have a worship service where there's a sermon. We have a, an evening service where there's more teaching and preaching. We have a, usually a midweek service where there's even more teaching. And we have retreats and we have seminars and we have lectureships and so on and so forth. And all of these things, all of these things are based on the idea of understanding more perfectly what the scriptures are teaching. And then secondly, another lesson is to obey. Once we've understood in context the teaching of scripture, we want to apply accurately what was being taught then to those people. We want to be able to bring that and make a proper application to ourselves in our own lives today. The scriptures were given by God for people of every age, but it requires some effort to make sure that we apply correctly today the instructions and concepts communicated you know, several thousand years ago. It's possible. We just ha have to understand the context, you know, the point that was being made. Like in Jude, is there anything that Jude was saying to these people some 2,000 years ago that can't be applied today? Right? Watch out, you know, watch out for false teaching. Uh, false teachers better be careful because they will be judged. Uh, is there anything there that we can't do today? No. We, we can, we can you know, be careful of false teachers, we can do that. We can you know, try to understand the scriptures, we can do that. We can hang on to the body of teaching, we can do that. There's nothing in Jude that Jude was saying to the church at that time which cannot be applied in the same way uh, in our church today, some thousands of years ago. The scriptures were given by God for people of every age, including this one. However, once we do grasp the meaning, we want to obey the things that God has given us in His word. You know, in Matthew 28, for example, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Is there anything there that we cannot obey today? Go into all the world? Well, they went into all the world, we can go into all the world. Preach the gospel, they preach it. Is there anything we can't, we can preach the gospel. To who? To all the nations, okay. Make disciples of them. Can we make disciples today? Yes. How? By baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Can we do that today? Sure. Water is water. Baptism is baptism. Father, name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? 
And then what does he say? Teaching them to do what? To obey, yes, all things that I have commanded you, all the things that he has commanded and taught. Can we do that today? Sure, we can do that today. See what I'm saying? So we, we understand what it says, we understand the context so that we don't, you know, we, we properly grasp what, what the point is, the spirit of the thing, and then we apply it to our situation today. And then the third thing that we try to do, we understand it, try to obey it, and then the third thing, pass it on. Once we've understood and begun to apply these things in our own lives as Christians, we begin not only teaching others this body of doctrine, but we also teach them to pass on this cycle of learning, obeying, and passing on to the next generation. Again, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Short form, whatever I've taught you from the word, you understand, you obey, and then you teach others, and you also teach others to pass it on to the next generation. Can we do that today? Absolutely, we're in the process of doing it. As a matter of fact, you know, the whole BibleTalk.tv, you know, the, the, our, our, our internet ministry, is an effort to do that, to accurately teach the scriptures in such a way where the information is preserved and can be easily passed on one to another using uh, modern technology. So this is why we have training classes, why we take, a long, uh, we take a long time to select elders and preachers and teachers and deacons. Why? Because they must be ones who are able not only to understand and themselves put into practice the things that are written here, but they also must be able to instill in others the desire and the ability to pass on this treasure, this treasure which is the word, onto the next generation. You know, our congregation here has been in existence for se over 75 years. Now whether or not we continue to you know, exist for another 10 or 100 years will not depend on getting you know, just more people to, to attend this building and, or to expand this building. Our future depends on whether or not we can teach the church to understand God's word, to obey God's word, to preserve and to pass it on intact to the next generation. That's our goal. And that's the goal that's been given to us by the Bible. That's not something that the elders came up with or the preachers at a ministry meeting. You know, somebody said, you know what would be a good idea? That we kind of teach the church and you know, we try to give them the information that's in the Bible. And you know, I, I have a good idea. Why don't we just make sure that they pass that along to the next generation? That's, that was, nobody came up with that idea. That idea, that command is in the scripture. The idea that there's one body of doctrine is not something we came up with. That's not a quote Church of Christ thing. That's what Jude says. And so we in the modern era, we try to understand, we try to obey, and then we try to find ways to preserve and to pass on to the next generation the teachings that were given to us and encourage them to make sure that they pass it on to the next generation and so on and so forth. So my hope for us here, listening to this class, those who may be hearing it online or you know, on video or in a book form, so on and so forth, my hope and my prayer is that you will be found faithful if the Lord comes during our lifetime. And if not, I pray that our children will be faithful and that we will have successfully passed on to them the teachings of Christ, the body of doctrine that Jude talks about, and that they, in turn, will understand and obey and pass on to the next generation. If we do that, we have done what God has asked us to do in this particular field of endeavor. Well, that's uh, the end of our short two you know, class, two, uh, two uh, lesson uh, series on the book of Jude. Uh, I appreciate your attention. I pray that God bless you in your study of God's word. Thank you.